I will be talking about the origins of Chaldeism. So there are many factors which are considered to have played a role in the emergence of Chaldeos. Different scholars have very different perspectives on the topic. I will be introducing three different ways of looking at the establishment of Chaldeism presented by Charles Chapman, Richard Morse, and William Beasley, which can be divided into two categories, the Spanish monarchy and colonialism. The Spanish monarchy is one aspect that led to the emergence of Caudillos. Charles Chapman argues that the characteristics of Caudillismo can be seen in the conquistadores. For example, like many of the famous Caudillos who came mostly from lower classes, many Spaniards who gained power in Latin America, such as Pizarro, was not a member of the elite society in Spain. Additionally, individualism, and more importantly, absolutism, according to Chapman, was a leading principle of political life for the conquistadores and this became a necessary part of Latin American politics since it was almost impossible to unite the Hispanic people without some form of dictatorship. However, Chapman also states that caudillismo is a form of resistance toward the old monarchy, which ironically ends up continuing the old values of the colonial period. Richard Morse also makes a similar approach to Chapman, but focuses more on two individuals of the Spanish monarchy, Isabella and Ferdinand. The two monarchs represent two contradicting ideologies, as Morse puts it, medieval and renaissance, Thomistic and Machiavellian. These two ideologies were also applied in Latin America by adopting a mainly Thomistic caste system, ordered from the imperfect to the perfect with the king on top, while including the Machiavellian aspects. In addition, Morse associates the emergence of Caudillos with 15th century Italy, when condottieri's local tyrants, came to power in a time of division and chaos similar to how Caudillos established their positions within the confusion after independence from Spain. He also adds that both deranged the predictable interplay of hierarchical class interests. Colonialism is also thought to be essential to the establishment of Caudismo. William Beasley mentions the concept of theory and practice in the region, which is more easily described in the maxim, I obey but do not enforce. This created room for relatively flexible government in the colonies, which gave immense power to a single person governing the region. To quote Beasley, the colonial period contributed to the centralistic rule, undivided authority, intense mental system that left the gap between theory and practice to be manipulated at the discretion of officials and the enforced legal restrictions. However, independence from the mother country meant the absence of a king to pledge loyalty to, which resulted in a divided population. Therefore, Caudillos, who had the charismatic ability to attract devotion from the local folk, along with their powerful positions with ties to not only the military and the government, but also the clergy and haciendas, were perfect figures to fill the empty positions. All three arguments tie into one another, which shows that the emergence of Caudillos cannot be attributed to one specific factor. Other scholars also point out different aspects of Latin America, such as the independence wars, as a key component to the origins of Caudillismo. This is the 11th time president, General Antonio Lopez de Santana. In the span of 22 years, from 1833 to 1855, Santana was the on and off popular vote for presidency in Mexico. He was elected in 1833. Santa Ana is well known for his self-centered nature, his ability to fight and lead wars, his notorious selling of a large portion of Mexican land to the U.S. Let's see where Santa Ana started his journey to his first president. He began as a cadet in the army at the age of 16. As he worked up the ladder, he eventually got the highest ranking general position. He did this by first starting with or, pardon, fighting with the Spanish in the Mexican Independence War. When he later switched sides and fought for Mexico in 1821, that same year, he was given the highest general position one could have. Eight years later, the Spanish tried to reconquer Mexico, but failed. Santa Ana was an integral part in Mexico's win, and, he, and it earned him a reputation amongst Mexico. A few years later, in 1833, Santa Ana was voted for the first time president. In 1835, the Battle of San Juancito um, began because Santa Ana had split up his army to survey Texas. Santa Ana, Santa Ana and his army were unprepared, and it resulted in Mexico's loss. 
in Santa Ana's capture and imprisonment. During this imprisonment, I learned that Santa Ana wrote a letter to a man named Parizo Martinez in 1836 to plea for help as someone was trying to steal from him. When he was eventually released, he fought against the French at, at his birthplace, Vera Cruz. During this battle, Santa Ana lost his left leg. After winning this battle, he made a spectacle of his lost limb and even had a proper burial for it. Santa Ana retired in 1874. He wrote memoirs and unfortunately later died two years later. Juan Manuel de Rosas was one of the most well-known leaders to have used the caudillo system to rule over the people of Argentina. He used extreme violence to eliminate his enemies and keep those within his party in check. He became the sole power of who lived and who died. He would often send groups of men in two villages for certain periods of weeks to find and eliminate his targets. They would invade houses and kill people on the streets. The communities were left in peril, often coming out of their shut-in from the night before asking their neighbors how many throats had been cut and how many bodies there were. Although Rosas was behind all of this, he made sure to keep a distance between himself and the acts that were being performed. He often called these acts of terror his way of showing his patriotism to Argentina. The Unitarians that opposed Rosa's rule soon began to use violence as a way to getting their point across. There was an alleged incident where there was an attempt on Rosa's life by the Unitarians. It was said that they had sent a box to Rosa that was set to deploy bullets once it had been opened. Therefore, Rosa's government condemned the Unitarians in front of the people of Argentina, hoping to gain more power by this. This caused an uproar within the Unitarians. They called on the people of Argentina to raise up arms against the caudillo system and to kill whoever they believed to be in association with Rosa. The Unitarians called the Federalists barbarians and the Federalists called the Unitarians savages. Now the terror was beginning to progress as both of these sides started killing more frequently whoever they believed to be associated with the other side. The terror's climax was reached at the end of March 1842 as disfigured bodies were present around the capital every morning. Most of the terrors would happen at night. However, occasionally groups of men would attack their victim in broad daylight, either shooting them right there or seizing them and cutting their throats. All this political unrest and violence was not just at fault of Rosa, but the Unitarians played a part in this as well. They made way for Rosa's possessive rule, even if it was unintentionally. We see in the slaughterhouse, this is a resistance to Rosa's rule, but more importantly to the Caudillo system as a whole. The slaughterhouse uses examples of barbarianism and the rape of a young man to get this point across. Although this is a piece of fiction, it draws on true elements of the Caudillo rule or Rosa's rule.